know that. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, so for anybody who doesn't know, Marco Hansen is a uh, highly experienced court interpreter based in Austin, and he has been involved with NAGIT and TAGIT and ATA and training court interpreters for years now, and it's a real privilege to have you here with us, Marco. Thank you, Kat. So the screen is all yours. All right. Um, everybody give me a thumbs up if you can see my PowerPoint. Give me a real thumbs up or an emoji thumbs up, but I always, it always takes me forever to find the emoji thumbs up, so I like these real ones here. Uh, we are uh, transmitting live from our studios in Austin, Texas. I say we, usually my wife is here sitting next to me. We sort of tag team these, but she is, my mom took her out to lunch for her birthday. Her birthday was last week, and so she sends her regards. And sorry she couldn't be here today. Um, but uh, our topic is uh, Latin phrases used in English and how we handle them as translators and interpreters. And it depends a lot on what language we're going into or coming from. But we're going to talk about uh, the meaning of some common Latin here and um, sort of uh, why it exists in English. And we see Latin all over the place. It's in uh, the mottos of universities and government entities. It's on little signs, lots of humorous Latin in our environment if we live in the U.S. on bumper stickers. And so, uh, and, and I'm just going to pronounce these however I feel like it. Uh, if you are a, if you are a <laughs> Latin, excuse me. Um, ciencia e labor uh, probably means science and labor. In vino veritas, in, in wine, there is truth. You know, the more you drink, the more honest you are. Carpe diem, uh, seize the day. These are things that most of us uh, have run across before. Um, but the topics that I'd like to cover in the next uh, little bit under an hour um, are some disclaimers, uh, what, what we are doing today and not doing, um, how we got into this mess, kind of the historical evolution of Latin as part of the English language. And then I just picked 30 Latin terms that I feel are going to be familiar to, mostly familiar to everybody here, but we're going to look at, um, sort of pull apart what they mean and how we would handle them in our work. And then there is a quiz. So uh, heads up, uh, the last part of today's presentation is a 10 question quiz and um, nothing, nothing depends on your grade. <laughs> <laughs> you if you fail, you have to pay for the class. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. If you fail, you have to take me out to lunch next time you're not. <laughs> um, but this is just for fun. Um, and so kick back and enjoy, put your feet up. Uh, the disclaimers are, as I am not a Latin professor, so it's easy to stump me. If you are good at Latin, then um, feel free to share some of your knowledge with us. I'm not. I've, I took a little Latin in college. I did not ever go to like the Latin mass or uh, take Latin in boarding school or anything like some people have. So this is not a rigorous academic lecture. It's a love letter to Latin. I think Latin is fun, and I like talking about language, and that's why I'm here today. And I appreciate uh, Jackie and Carol and the rest of the Meetup board uh, for giving me this opportunity and for you guys for giving up an hour of your Saturday to, to get together and hang out. We are all word nerds. If you are in this organization, if you're on this call, it's because you love words and you love figuring out how to say things in other languages. Um, finally, there are a lot of, uh, a ton of Latin and English that we just can't get to in the course of an hour. And so these are all Latin terms that you might uh, be able to throw out. I just sort of brainstorm per se, tierra firma, homo sapiens, bonus, verbatim, postmortem, veto, cum laude, in medias res, curriculum vitae, per diem, alibi, in vitro, alma mater, versus, subpoena, modus operandi, pro rata, pro tem, posse, vice versa, acumen, terra incognito, in toto, a priori, persona non grata, et cetera. There's just so much Latin that um, some of it we don't even think of about it being Latin, like veto. Veto doesn't sound like Latin to me. It sounds like English. But if you look up the etymology, veto came from Latin. All, uh, alibi, same thing. They've just become so much a part of our language that uh, we don't even uh, categorize them that way. And here is the little clip from uh, Disney's Aladdin, where I learned uh, quid pro quo back in the 90s. Maybe you remember that. <laughs> especially if you have kids. So the English language uh, is largely Latin and French, um, over half of English, and English has over a million words now. And so this is a ton of words represented in these pie charts. 
about a third of English is directly from Latin and another third of it is from Latin via French because as you can see in the little pie chart on the right, um, French is mostly Latin. And so um, the parts of English that aren't Latin um, come largely from Germanic languages like uh, Anglo-Saxon and uh, Western Germanic uh, languages. And then lots of uh, Greek terms will appear in science and some of those came to us through the Latin as well. And then the other sources of English are just really small and it's a big mix when you get down to those smaller categories. So this is small print and too, too small to read. I just want to throw this up here for reference later on when you get the PowerPoint, if you want to look at this. Um, this is sort of a timeline of where the English language came from. And if you're looking at England, what is geographically called England now or the British Isles, uh, there were in earliest prehistory Celtic tribes there who spoke Celtic languages that have survived in Irish and Gaelic and so forth. And then the Romans came and they brought all their Latin and they were there for hundreds of years and had a big influence on those tribes. Um, then uh, Germanic invasions came after the Romans and then they were followed by the Vikings, which brought some Scandinavian, uh, Norwegian, Danish words, um, Swedish. And after that, uh, the Normans invaded and the Normans were French speakers, French. but of Scandinavian origin. They were called Normans because they were founded by Northmen who came down from the north. And so they were sort of like uh, um, French uh, speaking uh, Scandinavians who invaded England and um, brought a lot more uh, French language and the French uh, legal system. And then during the Renaissance, when England started getting interested in in French and Italian and Greek uh, and Latin literature um, that was uh, thrown in there, especially in academic and high register language. And then as England spread out throughout the world invading everybody else, um, they brought back a lot of uh, Arabic and uh, Hindi and uh, Persian and terms from around the British Empire. So at that point, American English diverged from British English during the imperial days. But as this uh, timeline sort of summarizes, English has just a mess of languages from all over the world. And there's really no such thing as, as pure English in the sense that other languages can claim some kind of purity. Here's a map showing what was going on back during the days of the Roman Empire. Um, the red is the parts of the Roman Empire after um, sort of in the early Christian era that spoke Latin or some uh, vulgar dialect of Latin, which evolved into Spanish and French and Italian and Romanian and so forth, Portuguese. Um, and then on the blue side of the map, we see the parts of the uh, Roman Empire that were still dominated by the Greek language. And the Greeks came before the Romans and a lot of Greek was adopted into um, the Latin language and um, just merging and back and forth as those two civilizations kind of uh, grew together and traded with each other. So this is a funny quote that a writer named James Nichol came up with, and it, it's longer and I, I cut out the, the obscene part since, you know, this is a PG rated webinar. Um, but he says English doesn't borrow from other languages. English follows other languages down dark alleys, knocks them over and goes through their pockets for loose grammar. <laughs> so, so that's what's going on. That's how we are able to have this conversation here today because English is just voracious. It eats up other languages and spits out the parts it doesn't like. And English has the largest lexicon in the world right now. Um, com computational linguists have calculated that our our vocabulary, our lexicon passed a million terms a few years ago, and that's just ridiculously huge. None of us know even a fraction of those words. The average educated American English speaker knows up to about 30 or 40,000 words out of a million. So we all just know a fraction of this language's words, even if it's a native language. And on a daily basis, we'll use up to maybe 3,000 words in conversation. Um, so it doesn't take many words um, to be able to live in the United States and conduct business here. And we see that those of us who interpret for people who, who can get by in English, but they don't know the medical English or the legal English, we see that it's not enough to just know those 3,000 words when you're dealing with, with a language that has such a large vocabulary. So I work mostly in the court system, and uh, this presentation isn't just for legal interpreters, but it's interesting as an example of why English has held on to Latin 
to look at the court system in England and um, how that evolves over the last thousand years. And it started out when the Romans invaded England and spent uh, about four centuries there. And their written language was Latin. Their spoken language was a, a dialect of, let's say, simplified Latin. And they had a court system that they brought with them and uh, left behind after they, uh, the fall of the Roman Empire. But um, after they left, the later another wave of invaders were the Normans um, from uh, what's now Normandy in northwestern France. And they were there for another 400 years. And so they had a huge impact too and left a lot of um, what's called legal French, things like uh, voir dire. Even in Texas courts today, the, any trial starts with voir dire, which is a French term that was brought by the Normans to England um, several centuries ago. And it's, it's uh, based on an earlier Latin term, but we use the French one. Uh, Latin was used for all court records in England um, from the 1190s on until the 1800s. In 1362, a law was passed. This is like early uh, language access laws. <laughs> There's a 1362 law that says um, it's okay to do your oral arguments in English but you still have to keep your written legal records in Latin. And then another 400 years go by and um, English has become more and more popular and people are starting to say, you know, maybe English is here to stay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should uh, just go ahead and adopt it, uh, uh, commit <laughs> to this relationship. And so in 1730, English became the obligatory language for the courts in England, but they still used in certain kinds of uh, written instruments. Um, there were some traditional um, holdovers for an, over another 100 years. And then finally, in 1867, well after U.S. independence, um, Latin was uh, ceased to be used as the language of any written instrument except for um, phrases, Latin phrases that are still embedded in there. Just like when I'm speaking English to my friends from Brownsville and I, I throw Spanish words into there and just sort of switch back and forth. Um, that that uh, still what goes on in legalese in the U.S. and England and countries that inherited that common law system. And here on the left we have a photo of uh, the law from uh, which one? The law that made it uh, English the obligatory use in the courts of England. An early original copy of that. Hey, good. Layla just showed up. I'm going to pause for a second. Anybody have any uh, questions or comments about uh, this uh, brief sketch of of the Latin history of English? I enjoy these more if you guys throw out your comments and observations. Well, here's like. a question, Marco. Um, yes. I hope I'm not going to puzzle you, but in, in legal court, Marco, one of my favorite terms is audiator et alter pars. You need to listen to the other party, right? So this, this has not always been the case in the courts of England. So I'm just curious if you know, or if you can guess, when, when did this become you know, official? In other words, for a um, judge to give the word to both parties and kind of listen you know, to the defense, to the prosecution, etc. Because again, that wasn't this Latin principle who then was implemented, you know, in the English, in the U.S. system, etc. When was it, uh, you know, applicable or applied, if, if you know? And why did they decide to apply it? No, I would love to know, though. Do you do you have any idea? Well, they, they were. Yeah, well, <laughs> they got to the point that people were appealing so many cases over 80 percent saying you never gave the other party more than five minutes and the prosecution spoke for 45, 50 minutes. So mm. they had to come with this audiator et alter pars, which actually was first implemented uh, in, during Caesar. When, when Caesar was brought to court and you know they obviously tried to judge him because he started the war, etc., he was the very first human known being that was allowed to use audiator et alter pars. And actually when they asked Caesar, they said, do you have a defense attorney, Caesar? He said, no, homo homini diem. In other words, I am the only man that is going to represent myself. I, I am who I am, you know, and, and I, I don't need anybody to speak on my behalf. But over oh. centuries, you know, when somebody, again, wise enough or smart enough decided to, to do this, it, it was like a cross, crossroad, you know, cross point, because 
again, if you don't listen to both parties, to me, every time I go to immigration court for Romanian, right, or for Italian or for French, and I, I'm a little bit grasping the fact that not both parties are entitled to equal time, that's what I'm pondering or wondering about fairness and equal yeah. as, access to justice. So this Latin principle, again, audiatore alter pars, I think is the most important concept that you can have in a court of law. Huh. Thank you. Yep. I'll add that phrase to the next version of the presentation. Carol? Could you send it in the chat? Oh, yeah. Type, type the, the spelling, if you would, Mihai. Certainly. I will. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Like, I, I think I might get close, but not. <laughs> and, and, then, and then just a small, it, it's not a, I, I hope I'm not inappropriate. The term is voir dire. Meaning, voir is used, what you see is what you say, dear, right? So, voir dire, and, and I think Pauline, I see Lenoir, I'm, I'm, I'm sure she knows French, is not voir dire, whatever, it's, it's voir dire. What you see is what you're going to say, or, or what, what you see is gonna, what, what I'm going to talk about, or the text that you have in front of you is the text that you're going to read from. Again, this is exclusive French, but, and you're right. One of those roots that you mentioned, imported, right? Greek, French, Romanian. This is the French, voir dire. Again, it, it, I'm not going to waste time, but back then they have a hard time finding an equivalent. In, in other words, a word by word equivalent to this yeah. voir dire. That's why they kept it voir dire, you know? Yeah. And that's why even today, every time I'm listening to an attorney who doesn't speak French, butchering the words <laughs> personally i have a problem with that because i'm half romanian half french so i i like them to at least learn how to pronounce the words correct i think it's also important right uh, Mihai, when they talk about that Mihai, are you sure it's pronounced the french way because i always encounter french words and i'm a french interpreter and i'm always stumped on how to use them or how to pronounce them in english because they, they, you, you get surprised how they pronounce the french words so are you sure it's voir dire like in french not voir dire, like some English speakers, uh, you know, pronounce it. Well, it well, okay, great point. So dire, okay, it's either something dire or it's dire straits, okay, one of the two, right? But voir dire, you cannot say voir dire because it's almost like you are seeing something that they're not going to speak about or talk about, you know. So it yeah. is voir dire. You, you know, so you see way. something, you speak about something, and, and, and I can, add, I will actually, not now, but post session to allow Marco, obviously, to give his excellent presentation. I can put, give you some resources about how voir dire is actually, how, is, how should it be integrated, right, within the part of a trial and, and, and everything else. So, yeah, it is voir dire. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. I was just going to comment yesterday, I was in a group talking about um, different words, and the word apocalypse came up. Huh. And the etymology of apocalypse is originally Greek that came to us through Latin, yeah, and then into Old French and into English. And the primary meaning, well, the meaning in the original is a revelation that is life altering. Oh, but of course we talk about the, so, you know, anybody who is familiar with the Bible, the apocalypse is the revelation. Right. But we have segued that into now an accepted meaning of it is something cataclysmic. Right, right. <laughs> so just for giggles, I looked at the Spanish to see what the Spanish meaning, current meaning of apocalypse is, apocalypsis, and it is only the idea of cat cataclysm. Huh. So for me, this is just such a fascinating little look at how languages circulate and affect each other over and over and over. Yeah, it's a good example. And when you have time, Carol, just look on how much Latin is kept in the original Bible. Okay, oh, the yes, Bible yes. that I read, the Bible yeah. that I read first, okay, even before I spoke Romanian. Uh -huh. was Latin 95%. That is the Bible that, again, if you're able to read, you understand the Bible. Of course, then they will come with versions, Italian, Romanian, English, etc. But if you have access to the Latin Bible, that's going to be a revelation in itself. It was to me. Thank you. 
So moving beyond the scope of the law, we also see tons of Latin in other scientific pursuits like medicine, and uh, many of those will mix uh, Latin and Greek together because the, the Roman Empire learned its science, uh, a lot of its science and philosophy from the Greeks that they conquered. And so a word like neonatology is made up of neo in Greek and natus in Latin and ology from Latin, and those are put together. And by the more um, scientific and high register vocabulary we develop, and the more we sort of pick it apart in our head and think about the components, then the more new terms we're able to understand the first time it comes up at an interview or an assignment or whatever. And so I think this is, uh, this is really the, the practical reason that it's helpful for us to study uh, Latin and Greek as uh, language professionals. So this is the list of 30 terms that I came up with um, that I'd like to um, go over today. And uh, I'll give everybody a minute to read these. And probably some of you uh, know all of them and could define all of them right now. Um, hopefully there's a, there will be something in there that you haven't seen before that you haven't thought about that will expand your vocabulary today. But I'm gonna go through these now one at a time and I've come up with some um, mnemonics and uh, memes and comics to go with some of them to make them more memorable. So first, uh, one and two, these are sort of grouped together in uh, related terms. We have actus rea and mens rea. And if you speak Spanish, uh, you know that one word for a prisoner is a reo, um, probably from the same root, uh, the guilty person. Um, act sounds like act, actus. Um, mens sounds kind of like mental. And so you can associate that with the uh, mental state of the person who's guilty. And so for a crime to be committed in a lot of cases, the Prosecution would have to prove both that uh, you did something that is illegal and you actually intended to do it, that you had the state of mind. It wasn't just an accident or somebody who was uh, mentally incompetent. Three and four are uh, two phrases that begin with ad. Um, ad uh, sometimes means four. Uh, you can translate Prepositions for me are hard to translate between languages in general, uh, because often one preposition in English has five different uh, prepositions that it can be in the other language, and then each of those five can translate back into five different prepositions in English, depending on the context. But sometimes ad means for, um, for this and for the case are ad hoc and ad litem. And there's a restaurant in California called Ad Hoc. <laughs> the, the subtitle is for temporary relief of hunger. <laughs> <laughs> We also hear about an ad hoc committee that's put together to just solve a single problem and then is dis disbanded. Or an ad hoc interpreter might be that bilingual person down at the police station who is pressed into service as an interpreter because they either don't know where another interpreter is or they don't have any desire to go out and hire one. Um, and so it's, uh, it's sort of a synonym for uh, temporary or single, single use. Ad litem for the case. Uh, I hear that mostly when a child is involved in a court case and the court assigns a lawyer to represent the interest of that child uh, just temporarily, like maybe for a single hearing. It's not that the child has actually retained that counsel. Five and six um, are two more uses of ad. In this case, instead of four, they're translated as at and to, ad hominem and ad infinitum. <laughs> Ad hominem is when you attack somebody else as a person rather than what they're saying. We see this once in a great while in political debates. A candidate will not address the actual uh, content of the position, but rather, uh, we can't trust you because of this thing that you did as an individual. Um, so hominem, um, you can think of it as being associated with um, other uses of homo, like uh, homo sapiens, referring to people. Um, so against the person. Homo right. homini lupus, Marco, is that you will be a man to yourself, but a wolf to other men. Okay, mm -hmm. so to me, that's my favorite. Homo homini lupus. You are a man of your own. You are a man of character. You are a man of, you know, personality, but you will be seen as a wolf by the other man. So again, <laughs> homo homini lupus, maybe for part the, yeah. of this one. That's cool. Put it in, type it up for us so we can... We can expand our vocabulary here. 
ad infinitum and sort of it's a humorous um, synonym ad nauseum, both <laughs> mean going on and on and on. Like this meeting has just been lasting ad infinitum to infinity. Um, ad nauseum means to the point of making you nauseated. Next, we have uh, Amicus Cura Curia, Curie, Curie, I think, Curie, Amicus Curie, Curie, a friend of the court. And this is usually when um, there's a lawsuit going on and there's some third party, like let's say Mita, that isn't a party to the lawsuit, but Mita has an opinion about it. And Mita prepares an Amicus Curie brief, which says, uh, since you, Your Honor, are dealing with a case involving translation and we, um, our, an organization of translators, we wanted to contribute some of our expertise to help you in, in ruling. And it might be a lobbyist or um, an expert um, who just wants to contribute because you feel some stake in the outcome of the decision. Um, amicus is sort of, uh, it's like the Spanish word uh, amigo. You can tell that it, it sounds uh, like a friend or amicable is an English adjective based on the same root. And curie is a word dealing with uh, the court. And I think um, it's also used in, in context uh, related to wisdom and knowledge and, and um, so forth. Bonafide is just a good faith. And it means uh, something that's sincere, honest, uh, real. Uh, what's the opposite of a bona fide marriage? Bad faith. Yeah, a bad faith marriage. Let's say um, I unfaithful, right? Or or it's just fake, um, a fake marriage. Let's say somebody wants to get a visa to live in the U.S. You're single. He says, "Hey, can you pretend to be my wife?" We just have to go to an interview with immigration there and ask us questions about where we met and stuff. Um, and, and there there was a rom com like this came out years ago. Of course, in a rom-com, they're pretending to be married and then they actually fall in love and they end up uh, having a, a bona fide marriage at the end. Um, but anything that's bona fide... And then they don't allow them. And then they're re they are refused because they say it's their fake marriage. <laughs> Did you see the same rom-com? So, so bona, um, uh, like uh, bonus, uh, means something good. And fide, uh, like the... Who knows the, the slogan of the U.S. Marine Corps? Semper, semper fi. Semper fi, which is short for semper yeah. fidelis, which means like siempre, always, uh, fidelis, uh, faithful. So the United States Marines uh, vow to be forever faithful to the United States, to the Constitution, and that uh, fi is the same root as fide in this expression. Here we have a funny bookstore called Caveat Emptor Used Books. And I'm just going to go out on a limb here and guess that Caveat Emptor does not have a refund policy. If you buy a used book from there, you need to just beware that book is yours forever <laughs> and you can't take it back. Um, because Caveat, like the word Caveat by itself, is a, is a warning or a, an exception. And Emptor um, is uh, related to uh, buyer. And so if a contract has a caveat emptor clause, that means it's not Costco. You can't take it back anytime you want. I know people who like take stuff back to Costco 10 years later and it's all worn out and used up and they try to get their money back. And, and Costco generally has the best re returns in the world and they'll take back anything that you ever bought, that you claim to have ever bought there. And they'll be like, how much money do you want? And they'll give you your money back. So Costco is not a caveat emptor kind of a return policy. <laughs> um, Kara. I just I just had a quick housekeeping thing. If people could remember to remute themselves or mute themselves whenever that they're not speaking, that would be good. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Ceteris paribus means with other things the same, and it's just a fancy way of saying all else being equal. Now, some Latin we've retained because it says something like vordir. Um, that's my Texas judge, my Texas rural judge pronunciation. Um, we retain things like that because there's just no um, real good equivalent in English uh, that means exactly the same thing, while other Latin is just retained sort of because it sounds academic. It's a, it's a highbrow, high register, intellectual way of expressing yourself. And ceteris paribus is an example that has a perfectly good English rendering, all else being equal, um, but it's uh, used in setting up logical arguments. If you keep everything else equal and just change this one factor, um, then how will that impact the result?
Oh, thank you. I see Mihai wrote out a couple of phrases he had been talking about in the chat. Well, cogito ergo sum, Marco, is <clears throat> I, I can think or I can... Um, I think therefore I am. Think of something, right? Therefore I exist. So that therefore, ergo, but, but it's one of my favorite expressions. Again, cogito ergo sum. In other words, what differentiates me from other, I don't know, species is the fact that I can think, I have intelligence, yeah. therefore I exist. Cogito ergo sum. Yeah, that's good. So ergo from that expression just means therefore. And if you wonder the difference between the two, um, Winnie the Pooh has demonstrated for us. If you say therefore, you look like the top Pooh. If you say ergo, you look like the Pooh in the tuxedo with the fancy eyebrows. <laughs> uh, lots of memes when you start searching Google image search for Latin memes. Um, number 12 is de facto and 13 is de jure. Um, in this case, we have day being translated two different ways, but they both um, are like uh, um, the day in modern uh, romance languages. Um, de facto, for all intents and purposes, a de facto relationship might be another way of saying a common law marriage. If you are living with somebody and you are holding yourself out to the community as a married couple and you are doing the things that married couples do when they cohabitate, then you are in a de facto marriage, even if you don't have any kind of uh, paperwork to prove it. While de jure or de jure um, means according to law, and that is something which the law says should be done this way, but maybe it's done that way, maybe it's not, maybe it's like an archaic law that we don't practice anymore, maybe it's a new law that all the jurisdictions haven't found out about, um, but basically that's used in context to mean that's the way you're supposed to do it. A textbook, a textbook solution would be de jure. Something that is de jure is in place because of laws. When discussing a legal situation, de jure designates what the law says, while de facto designates what actually happens in practice. Thank you. So those are used in contrast to each other. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, number 14. This is one that you see more in academia, um, sometimes in citations used in a lawsuit. Um, et al. just is an abbreviation for et ali. And why, why et ali needs to be abbreviated? I mean, it's a four-letter word. And when we abbreviate it, we get rid of one letter, and then we replace another one of the period. So I don't know. In my opinion, that we could have just left that as et ali, and it would have um, worked just as well. Um, but it's when you have a string of like 20 people's names in a title and you don't have room for all of them, you'll drop out the ones that don't fit and then just put et al, meaning something kind of like et cetera, et cetera, um, other people. Mark, you have this poor researcher whose name was reduced to et al in the title of his study. Marco, I believe this one is, is pronounced et al. And I, I've used it myself in my thesis, my master's thesis, and my, my own... Uh, Counselor told me, you, no, no, you, that's not how you pronounce it. You pronounce it et al. <laughs> et al. Okay. Et al. Thank you. What was the title of your thesis? Um, it was a, a master's degree about economics, uh, comparative economic uh, um, analysis of the Lebanese and Israeli uh, uh, sector. Cool. I'm, I'm an economics major. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. And I came back to interpretation, my passion. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. The irony is when they use it all, when it's only just one other party. Oh. So <laughs> they put in the abbreviation just to substitute for one name instead of just adding that one additional name. Like like the one guy that they don't want to get credit to. <laughs> yes, I know. It makes it ironic. No, 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 no. There's very strict uh, uh, rules on how to write a thesis with a dissertation, PhD dissertation or master's thesis. You can only use a certain number of, of names. And then anything over, even if it's half a name, it has to be etal. Huh. I didn't know <laughs> that. I stop you and make you write the thesis all over again if you don't follow those rules. They're very strict about it. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, another use of uh, et is in the expression et sec, which is short for et sequens. Um, and that means, and the following things. And um, it would be if there were several pages in a section that's being cited, and uh, rather than list all the pages where it's mentioned, it just means it starts at this page and it goes on from there. So if you, and, and I just want to pause right here because we're halfway through the list. 
Um, we are a multilingual group here. Not all of us translate into and out of the same languages, but I would like you to consider if you were, which of these you could use in your other language. And those of us who work in the Romance languages can use a lot of them because um, the Latin is shared not equally, but um, broadly amongst our languages. But those of you who work in um, non uh, romance languages and languages with no connection to Latin, um, such as Arabic, um, Chinese. Um, I'm, I would love to hear at uh, some point in this presentation how you handle things going to Latin. Like, do you first have to translate it into plain English and then the English into your language? Or how do you, how do you get around the Latin obstacle? So you can think about that. Now we have a couple of phrases that begin with X, kind of like um, X meaning out of or not in any English uh, prefix. Um, X officio means that I do it be, by virtue of the office. I am the mayor of this city, so I can act, act X officio as the mayor. Um, while X parte means that um, there's more than one party involved, but um, I'm acting in the absence of another party. And we see that here in um, courts uh, where somebody wants to get divorced, like a, a woman lives here, her husband lives back in El Salvador. She's trying to get divorced. They've been separated for 10 years anyways. Um, so she has had papers sent back to him. He refused to respond or else he can't be found. And she doesn't want to wait forever for this guy to show up. And so she goes in and gets an ex parte divorce or sometimes an ex parte protective order um, the other person who's being accused of the abuse isn't, uh, they can't uh, find him or her. And so the one person who, who cares to uh, submit the application will appear ex parte. And this is just a plaque from an important Supreme Court decision of the 1800s called ex parte Milligan. And that's how you eventually become an ex-spouse, Marco, right? That's how you become a what? An ex-spouse. An ex-spouse, right. <laughs> right. You know, as a result of the whole process, exactly. then you can or make reference to an ex-spouse. is the same, you know, trend, yeah. if you yeah. will. Yeah. Mindset, yeah. Good point. So I feel like ex-officio and ex-parte are pretty easy for anyone who knows English because office looks like officio and parte looks like party. Um, those don't take any special uh, mnemonics to uh, figure out. Habeas corpus is a is a kind of um, legal action um, when somebody's in jail and somebody else says he doesn't need to be in jail and it's often um, a, a charitable organization that is trying to get people out of prison who are wrongfully imprisoned. In this case, it's a political cartoon involving the 9/11 detainees in Guantanamo Bay. Um, I was hired one time to help uh, the American Civil Liberties Union who was filing an ex parte, a writ, uh, not ex parte, an ex parte petition for a man on death row in Huntsville prison in Texas saying basically he is in prison because of invalid testimony back at his trial 20 years ago. And they've gone through all the paperwork and found stuff that was mishandled. And they're trying to go now to the federal judge and say, the, the government has no right to hold him in jail at all, much less to execute him. And so that is a um, habeas uh, related to the verb to have, um, like um, haber in Spanish, and corpus related to our word corpse in English, uh, the body, um, the physical presence of the detainee. And Mihai says that the Habeas Corpus Act in 1679 was passed in England back when Latin was still the language of our courts. Thank you. All right, now let's do a couple to start with in. In in Latin uh, sometimes translates into in in English. We have in absentia and in extremis. In absentia is pretty obvious. It means in the absence of the other person, um, just like uh, not exactly, but uh, similar to uh, ex parte that we saw in the previous slide. An extremis means in extreme conditions and usually on your deathbed. Like if you are in a car wreck and the ambulance comes just as you die and the last thing you say is, yeah, I want all my property to go to my son, that kind of thing, that would be a, a verbal um, well made in extremis. 
Uh, here we have a book by a war correspondent who, which I haven't read, but apparently she has uh, been found herself in extremis in the course of her reporting on wars, and it looks like she lost an eye. You know what's interesting, Marco? How they use in extremis a lot in soccer when they would score a a goal in overtime, they would say that that team won in extremis. It's it's you know a lot of that uses. So. Huh. You're right. The main meaning is what you said, but but a victory in an overtime, especially in soccer, sometimes in, in NBA, I haven't heard it in NBA too, too often, but in soccer, that goal in the 95th minute is a goal in extremis, <laughs> is how they would refer to it. Oh, that's funny. Uh, next, uh, 21 is in re, and you see this in um, when you um it's forward an email sometimes it'll say like fw for forward or uh depending on the platform it'll sometimes have re instead of a uh, subject um and i always just guess that re stood for regarding um, but i think it's actually from the latin uh, in re uh, meaning in the matter of and you'll see this in the title of uh, legislation and um lawsuit sometimes. In this case, we have INRI Capital One Consumer Davis Security Breach Litigation. This is a yacht. This is uh, called Mia Culpa, and I don't know the story behind this yacht, but I'm very curious. I feel like somebody is admitting to uh, having stolen the money <laughs> that he or she then used to buy this $10,000 boat, but I don't know. Um, uh, mia culpa, um, which is almost the same thing in, in Spanish, uh, means uh, through my fault, and it's used uh, as a sort of a synonym for a formal apology, like you'll see a Latin, I mean, uh, a politician get up who's been um, impeached, I mean, not impeached like the president, but um, lesser politicians, lower politicians who actually apologize for the wrongdoing. Uh, will say, um, will issue a, a formal mea culpa where they admit to um, mistakes made. And then kind of a related idea is nolo contendere um, or no contest. And that's where a defendant is like, uh, I don't want to come right out and say I did it, but I'm also tired of fighting it. Let's just pretend like I did it and, and move on with the process. <laughs> and you can even do that with uh, with a traffic ticket. If you go to municipal court, um, and you know you're at fault, but you don't want to come right out and say it. It's sort of a, a the, the the midway solution, and you get punished just as if you had pled guilty. Um, but there are certain um, consequences relating to appeals, like uh, the appeal the appeal rights are different for a guilty plea versus a nolo contendere plea. And so, if you're trying to keep track of uh, what this means. Um, I think of the relation between our English word contend and contendere in Latin. Um, I'm not going to contend with you over my guilt. I'm just going to go forward with the process. And in the Italian system, again, not to interrupt, there is a voglio contendere. I do want to argue, I do want to object to this because I have a different opinion. So nolo contendere is more used, I, I notice here in the US, Huh. But volio contendere or solo contendere means I do want to argue because, you know, I have my own reasons, I have my own defense, a different opinion, and so forth. Yep. Oh, I've never heard that. 24 is nunc pro tunc. That's how I say it. Um, it means now for then. And we have a couple of expressions here that use pro in them. Um, pro, which is translated for in this context. So... An action to correct a previous procedural error is a nunc pro tunc. Uh, maybe some in a legal setting, somebody has brought it to the court's attention that there was an error made in a prior ruling and a correction is made um, that is a nunc pro tunc action. While quid pro quo um, is, a, is an offer of exchange of uh, one thing for another. Here we have um, a picture from a law firm that sues employers for quid pro quo sexual harassment where like in this case the boss is telling his employee if you do this an appropriate thing for me then i will give you a promotion or i'll give you a raise um, that's called a quid pro quo um, sometimes used in a positive context but often in a negative context somebody's offering a quid pro quo that you don't want <laughs> yeah dana i agree <laughs> um uh, prima facie um, 
Prima, like uh, premier, uh, means first. Uh, fascia, uh, related to our word for face. Um, so at first face is kind of like saying um, at first glance or on the face of on the face of a matter. Um, before you look too deep into it, it is uh, apparent. Um, I think as in a lot of cases, it's just used as a high register equivalent of apparently or clearly. And so um, it is defined as a matter that appears to be sufficiently based on evidence so as to be considered true, uh, may or may not turn out to be true later on. And again, here's another book that I haven't read, but it's fun to see how many of these Latin phrases have found their way into the titles of books. And this is the, uh, this is not a book, this is a magazine though, this is about pro bono architects. So pro bono, uh, these are a couple more uses of pro to mean for. Um, pro bono is short for pro bono publico, which means for the good of the people, for the good of the public. And uh, lawyers are required by their state bar to do a certain number of hours of pro bono work or firms are required and then they juggle around which lawyers actually do that. Some interpreters do pro bono work. Um, translators can work pro bono as well. Anybody who provides professional services, if it's if it's non-professional, um, if you're if you're like volunteering to pick, pick up trash downtown, that's not really considered pro bono because it's more of uh, physical labor. It's it's uh, charitable work, but of a different kind. And then pro se is a synonym for pro per both mean uh, for himself or for oneself. And that's when you don't have a representative, you're your own representative. Like when you go to court and um, file a small claim suit um, by yourself against somebody who owes you a thousand dollars. And if you were to hire an attorney, then you'd spend all the money on that. 29 and 30 are um, sine qua non and status quo ante. Um, sine qua non, sometimes uh, the longer version is conditio sine qua non is without which nothing. This is the, I, I named the, the webinar um, Latin phrases are my sine qua non. I, I think it would have been better to say are my modus operandi. <laughs> it wasn't a very good use of sine qua non, um, but it made me laugh and so I used it. Uh, sine qua non is an essential condition. Um, unless you have this condition in place, then the uh, consequential action cannot happen. While status quo means uh, the way things used to be, it's short for status quo ante, and it means that somebody, for example, has been injured and they go to, to sue their attorney in court or their attorney goes to sue their employer in court to try to put them back in the condition they were before the injury, meaning not just pay for their medical expenses, but also pay for lost income and mental anguish and all the other things that have resulted have snowballed from this accident. And of course, Mark, you could have called the webinar status quo and then have a 30 second clip for in the army now. That's what I would have done. <laughs> Next time, next time, Mihai. Yes, Carol. Status quo is a fascinating one for me because I, I had not realized it meant the state in which before it was previously. I've always considered it to be the current state, mm -hmm. and so one of the things I've been looking and thinking of as people talk, especially about pronunciation, is that the longer we borrow a phrase into the wider English language, the more it becomes ours, and we pronounce it our way. Yeah. You know, like chocolate, who of us calls chocolate chocolate? <laughs> you know, we, we just don't. We've had it long enough. It's ours and it's chocolate and it's good. Right. Um, so, just <laughs> Delicious. For giggles, yes. so just for giggles, I pulled up the dictionary de description uh, definition of status quo. And it says the existing state or condition. Mm. So we've had it in the English language long enough that it's left the legal confines yeah. and moved out, changing the meaning slightly, moved out into the rest of the language. Yeah. It's also, Carol, if you say from the very beginning, chocolat or chocolatier, to me, it's like suiting my ears. I'm not going to have my ears scratched because it's the correct pronunciation. And, you know, well, you, it is the way you Im import it, you know, uh, from an audio standpoint, if nothing else, the, ve the very first time, because if you, it, it's a habit that you're training, you know, in the right way. And if you have the word the right way from the very beginning, you will keep it like this, hopefully for another time of usage. Well, actually, Mihai, I was going back to the Nahuatl because the Nahuatl is where we, although all the rest of us got it. 
and the chocolate, the TL there where you've got the sound. None of us use that in our other languages, but it's, <laughs> we have adapted it. Right. But the melting, right. Carol, the melting of the chocolate, la chocolat, right? Oh, well. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what melts my ear and my, I don't know, I, audio. I, I, I hear system, you on that one. You know? <laughs> I definitely hear you on that one. <laughs> and then, of course, there is an excellent movie called Chocolat. I encourage everyone to watch it and obviously remember the word, you know, in the way it's pronounced correctly. I do. Yeah, it's a, it's a great movie, Chocolat. Okay, we are... Um... I was going to do a written quiz, but uh, in the interest of time, let's make this a, a group quiz where you get in the chat and whoever types the answer first and hits return is the winner. All right. Um, this is your word bank. Um, what um, is an essential event leading to a consequence? What Latin phrase means an essential event leading to a given consequence? Condition sine qua non. Yes, Yadira won. Woohoo! Um, what is the fallacy of attacking your opponent personally? The fallacy of attacking your opponent personally. Beatrice ad hominem. Good. Um, what is someone who's not a party to the case, but wants to offer an opinion to help the judge? What do you call the kind of brief submitted by somebody who's not a party to the case, but wants to help? Amicus Curie. Yes, yes, Emma and Carol. And Yadira, oh, Yadira first. She's fast. How fast do you type, Yadira? <laughs> No clue. I, I've never been a fast typist, but <laughs> well, you are you are today. Um, mm -hmm. What do you call something that's established in the law, whether or not it's practiced in fact? A principle is established in law, whether or not it's practiced in fact. De jure, yes, Jackie, good job. Um, what is uh, the fancy way that Winnie the Pooh likes to say "therefore"? A synonym for therefore. Ergo, ergo, erg. <laughs> erg is actually a kind of uh, exercise machine. <laughs> but I know, I, know, I know what you're getting at. Um, what do you call something that is done by virtue of your position? Like, I can do this because I'm a senator. Ex officio, yes. Good job. Um, and what do you call, last one, something that is done in good faith, sincere? Bonafide. All right. Everybody got a hundred on the quiz, and that means you don't have to do any homework tonight. Aren't you excited? I was a high school teacher, so that was a big deal. Um, I'm going to put some, some links here in the chat. Uh, the first one is uh, the YouTube uh, channel where I'll post this video next week. If, if you miss part of it or if you want to share it with somebody, it'll be on there. Um, if uh, any of you uh, would like to, if you're studying for a test, like if you're getting ready for your next certification, looking for a study partner, I have a, sort of like a dating service for study partners um, uh, where people submit a little form saying, this is my language, this is what I'm studying for, and I try to match them up and introduce them to each other. Um, if you would like to give me some feedback on today's webinar, there's a survey link. Um, and then finally, there's a uh, WhatsApp group. I know a lot of us are like in 20 different WhatsApp groups. Um, but if you're looking for a WhatsApp group of people who are just all different languages all over the country, and they're very friendly and helpful, um, here's one that you can join. And we, we ask questions and share resources on there, um, people who have attended my webinars. So that concludes um, oh, random Latin phrases are my sine qua non. Uh, the floor is now open. If anybody else would like to share some, some Latin tidbit or ask a question of the group. And I have a little bit of housekeeping. I haven't gotten everybody's emails that if you want the recording or the PowerPoint. So please go ahead and send that now. I've only gotten like three. Okay. Especially if you didn't uh, RSVP for the event, right? If you're mm -hmm. RSVP, then your email will be in there. Yes. 
Okay. Thank you, Yadira. Thank you, Carol. I found this wonderful, Marco, and I love that we had such a mix of languages here today. Yeah, me too. Thank you, Pauline. I would love to hear from the Chinese interpreter and the Arabic interpreters. Um, what do you do with Latin when you're going into those languages? Yeah. We have it easy. The Spanish interpreters don't have to do much with it. <laughs> Often we just keep in Latin. Although, I don't know if you guys have gotten it. They're always like, so, no contesto? Like, uh, no, that's <laughs> or, not what we want. <laughs> or no low contender, contender. Yeah. Which means, shouldn't I shouldn't answer? <laughs> yeah. Right. Now go okay, ahead and answer. Just, yeah, please. Penny has unmuted answer. herself. Penny, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> the Chinese language does not have any direct connection with the Latin uh, language. So if I get some documents in advance, when I review them, when I come across uh, some Latin words, I definitely I need to check the dictionary. If it's during a deposition or a trial, I, I will ask. Yeah. Well, what what that term mean <laughs> means? You're like, then I will translate. <laughs> <laughs> Right. What about if Thank you so much. It's very helpful, this training. It's sure. wonderful. Thank you. Penny, I have a question for you. If you were doing like a diploma from an American university that had a slogan in Latin, um, like a lot of universities have it in their shield, and you're going into Chinese, would you would you figure out what that Latin meant and then translate the meaning? Or would you just like represent it phonetically? Um. So um, when I translate uh, diploma, I will uh, I do two things. One is that I will translate the the, the wording. Mm -hmm. I check the dictionary the from the Latin meaning into the Chinese meaning directly. Okay. Make a note there, and then also put use the uh, how to say that the just to make an image. Put the oh, insert yeah. the original image into the translated document and yeah. a note on honor that. Like a little screen capture, uh, a cutout. Yes. That's a good technique. Mm -hmm. What about um, Arabic? Uh, do we still have um, an Arabic interpreter on? I don't see. Oh, Dana. Dana, are you there? She might be going through a tunnel. She was on the move last time I saw her. <laughs> mm -hmm. When I'm doing a, a translation of a document that has Latin on it, I'm like a diploma or something, I'll tend to just leave it in Latin. If I'm going into Spanish, for example, that has the same alphabet and put in brackets, uh, something like Latin motto or Latin slogan. And then I just, I walk away because I, you know, I could Google it, but I, I don't want to put myself out as a Latin translator and figure um, they're hiring me to translate English or Spanish and not Latin, but it would especially be if, especially if we have something Marco like nihil sine dio, for instance, right? Nothing without God, nothing happens without the Lord. Uh -huh. You don't want to translate that. To me, it's even a inappropriate thing. You know what I mean? All, all of these sacred quotes yeah. have to be kept sacred, in my humble opinion. Yeah, especially if you're going into another related language that uses the same alphabet. If you're going into an unrelated writing system like like Chinese or Arabic or, or Russian, that that gets that gets trickier. Mm -hmm. How do you reproduce that original language? Yeah, but um, for the Chinese translation, um, people, the, the, especially the Chinese uh, speaking people, if they see non-Chinese symbols, or characters, if you do not do any translation for them, they say you they would think that I paid you, but you did not do the translation for me. <laughs> right. I want it all to be legible in my language, right? <laughs> that's that's tricky. Um, I would just I would just say a few more words, Marco, and I'm sorry, yeah. I'm not trying to to but when I was in high school and I did five years of high school, I studied Latin in the ninth grade. And I was frightened and everybody in my classroom was so frightened because the teacher 
we nicknamed him Lepidus. Lepidus means a rabbit. In Lat he looked like a rabbit, the teacher. <laughs> and every time he would come to class and he would say, you know, Mihai or somebody else. And in other words, get to the board because I'm going to ask you something. I was literally so scared that, that I, you know, I couldn't control myself. But at the end of the five years, I was actually more passionate about Latin than about Romania. I don't know if it makes sense. So that's when I started, you know, not only reading books in Latin or excerpts or, you know, the Bible, etc. But, and I think, and I understand Chinese, Arabic, other cultures. I think that if you learn this at one point in your life, it's going to better serve you, especially when you come to the court terminology. And, you know, because not only that you will know how to pronounce them, but you will know what they mean. And it's going to come easier for you to know what is that saying into that context. That's my humble opinion. Yeah. And when you come across a new word that you've never seen, you can pull it apart because you understand the pieces, right? The prefixes and suffixes. Josue? Uh, well, I, regarding what Mihai was uh, talking about, um, this reminds me of a presentation that I gave myself on the history of interpreters and translators. And for centuries, for centuries, Latin was the uh, um, um, oh, man, I'm, the lingua I'm, I'm franca. Sorry. The lingua franca. Latin was the lingua franca, uh, and what was known of, of the known world back then and even even in the um in the 19th century if you if you were able to speak french or latin you were considered an extremely well educated individual because you you would be able to understand many other languages at least understand in, in a written way yeah. so that that latin was considered and still is to somewhat considered that the language of the uh of the knowledgeable people yeah and the first is scribes me. this is my last saying the very first scribes in history knew latin knew how to write in latin before english or before any other language i think it's important for us to remember this so they were taught how to write the words line by line word by word and then they were you know with however they were writing the pergaments right but they were he taught Latin, not in any other language. I think that's very important. One thing I find interesting about that is that because Latin was the language of the educated, in English, the Latin-based, we have such, like you said, we have such a huge vocabulary. We, it comes from so many places. The Latin term is generally going to be in higher register. Yeah. But when you go into it, a language like Spanish, that's not necessarily so. Right. And I've had people come back and complain, well, your, your Spanish is higher register than the English <laughs> because they're looking at the word that's a Latin based a word and assuming that it should be the higher register. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in English, our low register words are all the Anglo-Saxon ones, the real exactly. short, short words. <laughs> You may have if changed I may, something. I'm just going to go get it. <laughs> in if I may add one. Many years ago, they used to have a course called etymologia, which was basically the roots of the words. And they would go into the Greek roots and the uh, Latin roots. Uh -huh. And that was normally taught in high schools uh, in Mexico, at least, uh, uh, back uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Yeah. If I may add one one last thing here is that the importance of the language and, and we're talking about Latin uh, and, and the history uh, of the world is is so huge and the importance of the uh, of the Latin and the Renaissance age it is immense too and here's why what what the western world is today regarding knowledge uh in many areas we owe it to uh to the conquest of alexander the great 
who brought the, all that information, all that knowledge from India into the Arabic Peninsula, there, into the Arabic Peninsula, that all that knowledge, knowledge went on to North Africa, and from or North Africa went on to uh, El Andalus, what we know today as Spain. Mm -hmm. And uh, once the uh, the Spaniards, the Castilians, start liberating the peninsula, there was this this king. Uh, Alfonso, Alfonso the Eleven, known as the Wise, and and this is a this is a fact, it's a very little known fact, that when uh, that the Renaissance actually the origins of the genesis of the Renaissance was Toledo, Spain, and why? Because um, it used to be a library over there. In, and the, the the particular thing about Alfonso XI was that um, that uh, he was a very progressive king, and he surrounded himself with uh, with a cadre of scientists, people that were studying this and studying the other, astrologists and so on and so forth. So they discover they discover in this library. I mean, yes, and a humongous amount of knowledge. Among them were, were um, treaties, treaties in engineering, treaties in architect, uh, architecture, and chemistry, and medicine, and um, uh, yeah. geography, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but all that was in Arabic. So, Let's remember that at that time the Arabic, uh, Arabic, Hebrew, uh, and, and were the vernacular language in Spain. So these people came to the king and said, "King, well, guess what? We found this and this and this." And said, "Where is it?" Well, it's in Arabic. Well, what you waiting for? You know, get on and with the game and translate this thing. Yeah. And the, the interesting, fascinating stuff is that from Arabic and from Arabic, somebody side translated into Hebrew. And then somebody translate that into Castilian. And finally, somebody translated that, and all this is side translation into Latin, who was written. And there is, there is the, uh, why all this knowledge came mainly from Latin, the knowledge that had been lost previously. And uh, and from there, that was disseminated all over Europe. And people from all over Europe came to Toledo to learn about this new new knowledge. And hmm. that's how the Renaissance came 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 about. And uh, and that was because it was written in Latin, the the language of the educated. Yeah, the the, the international language. One last thought, Marco, and and then and then I know you need to close. So. If anybody's interested in listening to Latin, how they were praying, how they were preaching, how they were um, addressing each other, I highly, highly recommend Umberto Eco, Il Nome della Rosa, The Name of the Rose. The movie was an English movie. They even showed them how they used to do the chants and you know how when they would be inside the church, how they were praying, the, the hub, hobbies they used, I mean, you know, the rituals they had to follow. A lot of it is in Latin. So to me, I don't think there is anything closer to Latin than Il Nome della Rosa, The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. I highly recommend the book. If you can read it in Italian, to me, that was the ultimate read. But even the English version is pretty good. All right. Thank you. Well, I got to get home. I've been here at the office all day. <laughs> Marco, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. you guys. Have a nice weekend. Thank Marco. you. Loved it, Marco. Thank you so much.